All right, there was a young lady who impressed me so much. I said, you got to come on the show the next day. All right, she made a presentation after me, things that I talk about on this program, some of the analytics from the election. I remember people were saying, oh, well, Trump got a record number of white people to vote for him. No, he did not. Uh, Hillary underperformed. Hillary underperformed, not black people. Hillary did. And she broke down the numbers in such a factual way manner. I was thoroughly impressed and you will be too. Uh, She's uh, a legal counsel writer and activist. Malaika Jubali. Malaika, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Thank Um, you for that intro. You deserve it. Appreciate it so much. Abari got in my brother. Happy Kwanzaa, everybody. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's get into your history because you were like a neighborhood favorite. You were the people's (laughs) champ last night. (laughs) All right. So tell us about your roots and your connection with the shrine. Okay. Well, I had a hometown advantage because I grew up in Atlanta. Actually, you know how we do. If you're from the metro area of Atlanta, you still claim the ATL. Where were you from? Gwinnett. I grew up close. I grew up in Stone Mountain. (laughs) Oh, The Rock, as we used to call it. I thought y'all called it the Smound. Who called it this? That must be some new stuff. That was some guys from the west side. No, thank you. (laughs) They must have been making fun of us. Yeah, probably so. But I grew up in Stone Mountain. Um, I was born in L.A., came out here. And you mentioned the shrine. That's actually my my home turf. So when we came over from L.A., both of my parents were activists. So, you know, it takes a village. My parents are the ones who, you know, raised me to be the way that I am now. And I was fortunate enough to be raised in the shrine of the Black Madonna where we talk about black liberation theology. That's a theology from James Cone. Uh, a baby, Ajaman, and they basically taught us, you know, we got to be powerful and be like Jesus while we're still here. We don't need to wait for the afterlife. And so that is, uh, you know, the theology comprised a big part of my upbringing and, and the way that I, you know, my thinking. Then I went to Emory University, so I decided to stay in the ATL so I could eat up my Chick-fil-A and eat my Zaxby's. So I stayed in the ATL for school. <laughs> Uh, African American studies, English double major, and th- back then it wasn't that cool to be woke. So I'll be like the only one passing out petitions because Emory was like it was so whitewashed. Like literally, yeah. the buildings are white. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It was so whitewashed. And I was like, y'all, we got to sign this petition. Let's go. Um, and so I was very active on campus, and then decided from that, from there, I wanted to really, you know, have a career that involved benefiting my people, benefiting Black people in particular. Um, so decided to become a lawyer, graduated from law school a couple of years ago, and now I work for the city. So I live in New York. I don't live in Atlanta right now. Uh, I live in New York City, and I am now the co-chair of Operation Power, people organizing and working for empowerment and respect. And we do a lot of community work, and uh, we focus on electoral politics up there. Beautiful. Something you did last night really impressed me. You broke down the numbers for this previous election. Talk to the listeners about that. Okay, well, you know, I think the inspiration for me even wanting to do this, well, it was a couple of reasons. So I work with Operation Power on a regular basis. Like, that's my heart, that's my soul, it's my spirit. And we wanted to say, okay, I know our people, we're reacting. We do that a lot as black folk. Like, we like to react to stuff. So it's a cop shooting, we protest. We go out in the streets, but then there's a lull. We don't hear nothing for about a couple of months until another tragedy happens. And so I was like, I need to be a part of an organization that's building a movement. We're not just reacting to things. And so with Operation Power, we said, okay, we know our people are going to be reacting. It's fair. Donald Trump is crazy, as you said. You know, he's a bloviating idiot. He just talks whatever he wants to talk. Doesn't make sense 99.9% of the time. Um, And so we wanted to rally our, our folks together. And so we said, let's do a seize the time analysis, a post election analysis, where it's not just going to be us talking about electoral politics and reacting to Donald Trump, but how can we incorporate that ujama, that cooperative economics? How can we incorporate what we need to do on the local level? Because there's still a, lot, still a lot of things we can do locally to fight back, you know, what's happening on the federal level. Um, and so that was the inspiration behind it. And so I was like just doing my research because I'm always reading something. I read like The Intercept a lot, a lot of uh, kind of global news sources, Al Jazeera, and one of the things that they were saying that was kind of my intuition, because I, I campaigned for Obama in 2012, and I was in Ohio, and I was talking to white people, black people, Latino people. They all had some of the same complaints about Mitt Romney. And so if these are the same people who could vote for a socialist, who people said was a socialist, who they said was a Muslim, he wasn't obviously wasn't any of that. If all these people could vote for Barack Obama in 2012, what flipped? What changed? What what? 
could be going on. We're going to talk more about that on the other side of the break. You have to look at this beyond the surface dimension of simple racism. Did racism and bigotry exist? Absolutely. He played that card. But when you look at how many white people voted for Barack Obama once, some twice, and then decided to jump for Trump, we voted for Barack Obama because we believed he would be a revolutionary candidate, a revolutionary president. He did not deliver the revolution. Now they're going with this guy who will probably hit the reset button and bring about the third dimension of, of hell. But it's a revolution still. We're going back to our legal counselor, our writer and activist, Makayla Jubali. Malika. Malika. I said Makayla. Where did I get that from? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Malika. It is like, you know, me Malika. <laughs> I like a Malika. Right, exactly. <laughs> so easy to remember. Yes. All right. So you're back with us. Talk to us about the election from an analytical point of view. Yes. So that was um, before we went out for the break. And also shout out to you for two things. Number one, this intro music. Thank you for some D'Angelo. I heard yeah. Twister earlier. That's, That's right. what's up. That's how we roll here. Um, and for your community work. So I'm, I'm again, I'm honored to be here and to be able to join you. Same. And I'm glad you continue to, you know, inspire and motivate the community and, and encourage other groups to do the same. Thank you. Um, so I'm grateful again. So that was the background when we uh, left for the break as to why we decided to do this. And so when we look at the numbers, I had friends who were like, you know what, all of my, you know, I got white friends and what are they thinking now? They must hate black people. I'm looking at folks. I don't know what they're thinking anymore. I can't trust anybody. We can't trust the same people that we couldn't trust before. Meaning that in 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016, you had more whites who voted Republican than they voted Democrat. You had more white women who supported a Republican candidate than they supported a Democratic candidate. So this is not new. The majority of white people vote Republican, and they have voted Republic, Republican every single presidential election since the 1950s. So you're saying the numeric numbers are virtually the same? They're virtually the same. So what we're seeing now, instead of a rise necessarily in racism, because racism has been here, black people know that racism has been formed the foundation of, of America since they decided to say that black people needed to be enslaved. They've always decided that we needed to uh, help support capitalism and in their way of supporting capitalism, capitalism is by saying, okay, black people, you need to be chained up and locked up so we can support this system. So that's how race came into the picture. And since that time, they've used any opportunity to, you know, implement racism to support the elite and to support, you know, their their form of politics. So racism is nothing new. Capitalism is nothing new. The intersection of those two is nothing new. And that's how it plays out into the electoral arena. And so, you know, if we're concerned about why white women decided not to vote for Hillary Clinton this time, a lot of times they're going to support their men. The men decided that they wanted to vote for McCain and Romney and Reagan and so that's what's happening again. So what we're seeing instead is an increase in the vitriol. We're seeing an increase in the bigotry. We're seeing an increase in, it's more overt. in the outspokenness of yeah. racism. But the roots of it have, have always been there. I think when you analyze this election result and you see, all right, African-Americans did not perform at the same rate that they did during the campaign of President Obama. That's because the candidate really didn't give you anything to vote for. I was one of the few guys on radio who would tell you who I'm voting for. A lot right. of people stay away from that. Right. Uh, I voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary. I was very clear as to why I voted for Bernie. I didn't think he could actually beat the machine, mm -hmm. but maybe he could hold the machine more honest and more accountable. Right. When I voted for Hillary, I would never forget the feeling. I went in to vote for Hillary, and it was almost as if I had to hold my nose to do it. I was really not voting for her as much as I was voting against Trump. And if I felt that way, being a politico, I can imagine how individuals felt who decided to sit this one out. Right. Right. And so uh, one of the things that I talked about last night is the fact that behind the headlines of, you know, major news organizations saying that there was this record support for Hillary Clinton and 99 percent of or 90 percent of black black people in South Carolina supported her. 
that there was a decline, a 40% decline in black voter turnout in yes. South Carolina as well. And so why was that? If we normally adamantly support a Democratic candidate, why was that? And the Democratic Party just didn't put a viable enough candidate for us to support. Yeah, the combined negatives were 120% for both candidates in the general election. Very interesting. Let's get to it. We have Candace in Atlanta. Candace, good day. Welcome. Hi, yes. Uh, have you finished your interview with her? No, she, she's still here, uh, but she she's going to roll with me on, on this conversation. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I wanted to speak on uh, three of your topics, actually, two or three. Uh, on the topic of Israel, I think that it's long overdue for America to take a more fair look at uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And I believe that America probably needs to look into uh, bringing in the Gulf Co Cooperation Council members okay. uh, to just talk about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue a little bit more. And Candace, uh, I completely agree. I, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to converse with you. But here's the hardline truth. The United States of America, they stood with longstanding U.S. policy. When there is a settlement law or a settlement resolution, it has to be a two-state resolution. Both parties have to be at the table. We've always said that as U.S. policy throughout every single administration, both Democrats and Republicans. So they didn't do, do anything that was more extreme this time than any other time. Netanyahu simply played this up politically because of the politics at home, which really don't translate well uh, in the United States of America. It was simply a political spin to make him look great with this exiting unpopular president in Israel. He's very unpopular in Israel. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I completely agree that we should take a harder look at all of this moving forward, but I don't think Trump is the guy to do so. Go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. And I just I worked in the Middle East a lot, and I really feel like there needs to be more talking in terms of diplomacy in terms of what's going on in that region, even across the Middle East as a whole. So, you know, under this new administration, I just think that they need to take a more uh, objective look at things from both sides and bring more people in from that region to talk. Uh, you know, a few of the heroes in terms of Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton, as well as President Carter actually went over and negotiated uh you know, peace between the Israelis and the Arabs in the past. And, you know, a lot of that has been downplayed, but I think a lot more of that diplomacy could be utilized. And on the topic of reparation, um, I'm going to just mention something that sounds a little unconventional. You've probably never heard it before. Okay. Um, you know, but I think, too, we really need to consider asking for reparations for the drug ep epidemic that hit the black community so hard in the 80s. And they say that this, you know, this was caused by the U.S. government and Reagan. It destroyed black families. Uh, generationally, I think a lot of the effects are still being uh, experienced by us. And it's not just an allegation that we've had as far as being blacks in America, but also I heard Judge Joe Brown expounding on a situation that happened in China where the Chinese felt like white America dropped opium drugs on them uh, because they couldn't uh, purchase tea or something the way that they wanted yes, to. Yes, all of that is true. And let me also bring up another element of this. Uh, there was an evildoer named Nixon, a real villain in the U.S. presidency. Now, this guy is the one who created the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. His chief aide, who went to prison, by the way, came out and said, listen, we actually targeted blacks and liberals, basically liberals, okay? So they yeah. targeted these individuals with an influx of drugs, not only to weaken their political movement, but to also arrest them, brutalize them, and because everyone was saying, you know it is fine, they're druggies, nobody cares, they were able to violate not only the U.S. Constitution and their uh, particular rights, but they were able to do this with an applause. Go ahead, sister wants yeah. to say something. Something to add to that, too. Hi, Candace. how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome. So... Going back to what's going on um, with kind of drug enforcement and looking at how we can have reparations be, you know, help repair some of that. 
it wasn't just, you know, Judge Joe Brown. The CIA actually admitted that there are some documents they did in an investigation to see what was going on to the Iran during the Iran Contra scandal. Mm -hmm. And they found out that Reagan was apathetic. He was informed and advised of, of the fact that a lot of these drugs are going into California. There was like a direct pathway between drug dealers in Nicaragua and drug dealers in the United States that were targeting black communities. And folks told him that, and he just did not care. So you had the apathy that was revealed in CIA investigations. You also have uh, Rand Paul, who acknowledged this. A white, you know, he's libertarian, so they don't believe in, in drug policy. They, they say he's Republican in running, basic, but he, say, he right. says he's a libertarian. Right. They say they're Republicans in, in basically everything but name only. Um, and so he talked about this as well. So it's not a conspiracy. It's not our imagination. These are things that they've actually done and that's been documented. And to shout out to the Black Panther Party, because this is ending their 50th anniversary. They were yeah. created uh, 50 years ago in, what was that, 1966. So shout out to them before we get into 2017, because Richard Nixon was also one of those people that tried to destroy, you know, speaking about destroying black organizations through drugs and, mm -hmm. and all this type yeah. of stuff, through COINTELPRO. He wanted yes. to end, you know, our black movement, um, and the freedom biggest, fighters. Yes, and the biggest dope dealer we've ever seen, Oliver North, ends up being a commentator for Fox News. Extreme. Wow. Extreme. Wow. Extreme. Yeah. And not only that, if you look at certain geographic regions like New York City, they they cleared out black people there with drugs. Yeah, well, I'm from, yeah, I live I live in New York City, and I remember uh, distinctly doing some lobbying. This was when I was studying, getting my master's degree, and I was working for the Correctional Association of New York. We did some lobbying in uh, Albany, so that's where the capital is, is headquartered. And we were like, yo, we see that these policies are destroying black communities. What is the deal? So we were trying to reform the Rockefeller drug laws, repeal those laws. Mm. And a senator straight up told me, well, you know what? We rely in upstate New York on all of these jobs. So he was directly telling us, we need to keep your people locked up so that our folks can have jobs in upstate New York. Wow. Wow. Sister, yeah. I appreciate your call. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here as well. I need you to give out your social media handles. And okay. How can people contact you? I'd normally use Instagram at Miss Jabali, M-I-S-S. -S. I'm getting too grown for the M-I-S-S, -S, but it's still Miss Jabali right okay. now. So M-I-S-S-J-A-B -S -S as in boy, A-L-I. All right, say that one more time. M-I-S-S-J-A-B -S -S as in boy, A-L-I. That's my Instagram. All right, Malika Jabali. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're still getting real with the Realest Man in Talk Radio. News and Talk, 1380 WAOK.